third time's a charm. <laughs> Pretend this is all new, you don't know the beginning. <laughs> My name is Jeff Snell, I'm a social innovator. <laughs> I'd like to share with you my social innovation story, and it will include an invitation to you to consider doing the same so that you can write your own social innovation story. My story comes in two parts, the present and the future. And the present's going to touch on work that's happening right now as I speak, real time. And we're going to show you social innovation models. And in the future, we're going to pivot, because that's where I would like your help. Our friends at the Stanford Social Innovation Review define social innovation as, quote, the best construct for understanding and producing lasting social change. And I agree. Further, it's a novel solution to a social problem that is more effective, efficient, sustainable, or just than existing solutions and for which the value created accrues primarily to society as a whole rather than private individuals. And then they give us a nice, helpful example, the quintessential social innovation, microfinance. Well, what does it look like? Now, I've had my fingerprints on the models I'm about to share with you, so I can speak to these authentically. But if you're my friend Cindy, and you're a social innovator concerned with the social problems of homelessness, unemployment, or poverty, you build a model called Riverview Gardens. Cindy led a team of folks to buy the oldest private country club in the state of Wisconsin out of bankruptcy and then flipped it into an urban farm. So the clients that you see there, those are women that no longer cycle back with a high degree of recidivism year after year. In fact, they're learning job skills that are quite transferable. They break the cycle of recidivism and those organic greens that you see are being sold at grocery stores and restaurants up in the Fox Valley. That former private country club swimming pool is now an aquaponics center. And what's really cool is that Cindy's model is now the oldest and most successful and sustainable social enterprise in the state of Wisconsin. She won the Force for Positive Change Award uh, in, its, in its debut. If you're my friend Andy, you're concerned about the social problem of urban education, especially the absence of opportunities for young children of color. So Andy throws in on a model called Cristo Ray Network. Andy and I and another colleague launched the current high school in Milwaukee that's already outgrown its first headquarters and they're now building a new school because the demand is so great. And the secret sauce of Chris DeRay is they target kids in the central city, almost always Hispanic, but they give them that college prep education by letting the kids work a day a week. And they're usually academically behind, struggling with language barriers, but what they learn in the job situation is a context to aspire. The money they earn goes back to support the school, that's part of the sustainability. But the fact that they're now looking around saying, oh, I can do this white collar job too. That context to aspire drives the outcomes. And so this population I'm talking about overcoming significant barriers graduates from high school and then matriculates to four year accredited programs at rates higher than upper income Caucasian families with degreed parents. And that's our future around 2035 as we tip into a minority majority. And if you're my friend, Anne, you're concerned about dementia and the aging of America. So Anne, as a social innovator, launched a model called Time Slips. And Anne flipped the script. She said, well, why would we focus on a fading memory and the deficit of it instead of the glorious imagination that persists? So Time Slips is facilitated storytelling leveraging the asset of imagination, and loved ones rediscover moms and dads and grandparents that they thought had faded away. You can get trained to be a facilitator at time slips. And by the way, Anne won the MacArthur Genius Award for this model, $625,000 cash. And as was mentioned earlier, my present work here at the university involves getting to work with campus family members in a program called Innovation to Market. So you can imagine at a research one, ranked 26 or 27 globally, depending on which publication you read, and a massive producer of Fulbright scholars, how fun it is to work with gifted, imaginative, innovative people looking to increase human well-being with their models. It's just a privilege to work on campus in this program. If you like this, if you're starting to lean forward a little bit, knowing that there's an invitation coming to you shortly, check out Solutions U. Hundreds of stories of average Janes and Joes, just like you and me, they roll up their sleeves, they go about building sustainable solutions to the social problems in their communities. And this was co-founded by my friends David Bornstein and Tina Rosenberg. They're 
best-selling authors for NYT and also uh, have won Pulitzer Prize. So these stories are expertly written, beautifully curated, and uh, it's flat out inspiring if you're tired of reading the conflict narrative of problems that persist. And instead you'd like to brighten your day by figuring out where there are solutions that sustain. This is, this is for you. So now we're going to pivot to part two, the future. And this is where your invitation comes in. To be a social innovator, to find a novel solution, to co-create your own story, much like the Janes and Joes that we've just covered. And we're going to start like a lot of good movies with a flashback scene. This is my parents' Thanksgiving dinner table about 15 years ago. And I'm using this to frame up the social problem where I could really use your help. And on that particular occasion, I sat down across the table from a young woman I'd never met before. And that's because she was there in my parents' house as a foster care youth. My parents raised the five of us and then opened up their home as a receiving home some years ago. So in the course of conversation around dessert, I said, so what are your goals? And she went on to say she really didn't have any plans to even finish high school, but she did have a life goal. She said she wanted to have as many children as possible, as soon as possible, because she said, the world is going to end soon anyway. Close quote. So that is the kind of stuff that sticks with you. It also makes for a bit of an awkward conversation. I mean, what do you say after that? <laughs> That's nice, more pie? <laughs> so on a multiple over the years, my parents have now had 327 foster care children in their receiving home up in Appleton, Wisconsin. So story after story, a little pathway to life success, almost no plans at all for some educational pursuit to equip them on that journey. And so I present to you a social problem here in the state of Wisconsin, foster care youth that need pathways to higher education. Here's the problem. 60% of those foster care youth will graduate high school, 40% won't. And that's compared to the general population rate of 90%. Only 25% will enroll in college compared to 60%. And only about 6% of those will even complete a degree by age 24. And that's not a baccalaureate degree. That's just any type of higher learning program post high school. So if not a pathway that includes higher education, then what? So what does happen if there is no equipping for life and self-sufficiency? And I just want to offer a caveat here. I, I'm not a baccalaureate snob. I'm, I'm talking about any post high school education program that leads to some skills for self-sufficiency. And the reason I think that's important is because here are the outcomes in the absence of that. 40%, 40% of the 8,000 kids and the Wisconsin foster care system will end up incarcerated by age 21, 50% by age 17, 30% will be homeless by age 24, 50% unemployed by age 24. The 50% who actually have jobs will earn significantly below the federal poverty level. And like the young woman's story I shared with you, 70% will in fact have children by age 21 and they won't be able to support them. 50% will have high cardiovascular risk hypertension, uh, obesity, body mass index equations that are out of whack. So how does that apply to the 327? So just to avoid the glazing over of the eyes when you do a lot of statistics, instead make it real. So of the 327 foster care youth in my parents' foster care receiving home, that means about 20 will have any kind of post high school education at all about 20, and of those, less than a handful actually obtaining a baccalaureate degree. The reason that's important, because with that magic ticket called the baccalaureate degree, they will go on to earn a million dollars more over their lifetimes than those who just have the diploma, high school diploma or no diploma. Think about that. That leaves another 130 of the 327 that won't finish high school. And you and I and the rest of society will pay millions of dollars every year to provide social support programs, including prison. Because at the end of the day, we are choosing to care for the foster care kids one way or another. And here's the kicker. 70% of the 
want the pathway. They're looking for an opportunity to equip themselves and not fall into that downward cycle. So do we have some shared agreement that we have a social problem? And I would invite you to put on the social innovation lenses because that usually means there's a really cool opportunity. So maybe you're thinking, why me? I just wanted to go to the TEDx talk. <laughs> I wanted to experience the E in TED. A little entertainment would be good on a Saturday. I'd like to answer that by riffing off of this guy. Remember that quintessential social innovation model? Microfinance that was referenced? Well, this is the guy that started it, Dr. Muhammad Yunus. And I had the pleasure of working with him some years ago. And I was there when a young student said, Dr. Yunus, you won the Nobel Prize for microfinance. You have touched one out of seven lives on the planet. You have lifted millions of people out of poverty. How long did it take for you to plan for that? I mean, it's amazing. And Dr. Yunus looked at him and smiled and said, I didn't plan on it at all. I saw a need and I responded. And I wonder if we're seeing a need. And by the way, if you throw in, I'm not promising anybody a Nobel Prize in terms of what we're working on. Maybe you're thinking, why here? To which I might reply, why here indeed? This is a state, an institution that is baptized in this thing called the Wisconsin idea. It is our ethos, the, uh, the wind in our sails, if you will. So I love this quote by a president from some time ago. But I also think it's really interesting in terms of how it applies to every family of the state that we have this amazing public higher learning system that's to work in the benefit of every family in the state. Every family, not just those of high upper income and kids who happen to score really well on a standardized predictive test. And boy, do we know families that need us. So when we talk about a UW that changes lives, I believe in a UW that changes life outcomes as well. And I'm a long time, died in the wool, born here, Bucky fan. And something I appreciate is that Bucky doesn't back down. When Bucky sees a challenge, Bucky steps up. And then what if it doesn't work? You might be asking yourself worse, what if I show up to one of your meetings, Jeff, and I'm just bored? I feel like I'm wasting my time. You can opt out, but I would offer up we got plenty of room to go up. I mean, I really like our odds of being successful. We can get a lot of good work done. And we get to work and learn with a really cool coalition of the willing. I just want to make a pause here to say, of the dozens of people that I've talked to across the foster care system in the state, all those stakeholders, everyone works really hard. They're amazingly dedicated and gifted people. But to the great credit, they would all acknowledge that higher education is the pathway to change those outcomes. And they would also say, we can do better. And they're excited to learn from you and your cross-sector thinking and how we can solve together. And we get to use a really cool tool in the social innovation toolbox called collective impact. And the gist of it here is that we don't have to own the whole solution. We can just figure out across maybe the 30 moving parts from age 14 to 20 in the foster care system where to make those tweaks and pivots. And then collectively, those changes really add up. Those outcomes can change, both to the positive and diminishing the negative. And plus, we have a good start. I just want to wrap up by thanking those that have talked with me in the dozens in preparation for today because they offered up some pretty cool ideas. And I just share these with you as breadcrumbs to start to seed your thinking about how we can go about novel approaches. This one I think is especially interesting. Did you know that across the UW system, 21 of the 26 campuses are down in enrollment? And this is not going away anytime soon. There's a shrinking number of college age students. So color me silly, but I wonder if we've got excess capacity in dorms on these campuses and the number one challenge faced by kids aging out of the foster care system is they need a place to sleep so they're not homeless. I wonder about the possibilities. And somebody else pointed out to me that households with foster children are much more likely to be in the lowest income category. These are not wealthy families that onboard a new sibling. And I looked into the Wisconsin data, and this is absolutely true. It's true nationally, it's true here in the state. In fact, as I dug a little deeper, most of these families, these households with foster, foster children, are eligible for Bucky's tuition promise. 
That was a program launched in 2018, right here at the flagship. If you're below a certain median income across the state, you get free tuition and certain fees are waived altogether. Why are more families not availing themselves of this really cool opportunity? I think we can solve for that. And the ACT for the kids that say, well, I, I can't afford it, I gotta get a job, and by the way, I'm not good enough, I'm not prepared. Even ACT has reported that over time, this disparity between the high income and the low income continues, continues to grow. And the, the point here is that if you're a higher income household, your kids are much more likely to have a high ACT or SAT score. If you're low income, the opposite is true. So if we know the kids are coming from disadvantaged circumstances to no fault of their own into homes with low household income, I just wonder why we continue to create a barrier. In fact, this article from earlier this month in The Economist points that out, and I love what they're saying here, which is if you're already adding another measure to screen out applications from an already disadvantaged population, ultimately, you, you kind of got to ask yourself, based on your mission and identity, who do you serve? Wouldn't it be cool if we could just tell kids out of the foster care system? And by the way, it's 10%. So 8,000 foster care kids in the state, 10% are aging out. This is 800, 900, if you round up a little bit. It's not a massive population. Like, this stuff is doable. So tell those kids, you know what? Don't worry about the ACT. You've got a lot going on. Just let's get you prepared to come to school. And you can go to one of our campuses where we actually have room for you. A few others. What about removing the cosigner requirement on a college loan application? What about some of you as student bigs being willing to take an email from someone who's aspiring up through the system to say, hey, I'm interested in Madison or one of the sister campuses. Could you answer some questions for me? Wouldn't that be cool to have at least one person that you could reach out to? What about tuition waivers? Extensions of existing grant programs, both in duration and in eligibility. So if it takes you more than four years, the money doesn't get cut off. That would be pretty cool. Or income share agreements. Let's get you to the degree, get you on your path, and you can pay back over time as you go about your, your earnings and your lifetime. Pre-college summer offerings, online offerings for rural kids. These are kids in the system that really have it bad. Remember, that even assumes they have internet connectivity. But there are no after-school programs in a lot of these rural communities. These kids are already isolated. Campus opt-in communities and gatherings. I know this sounds silly, but as I stand here, an email going out to the roughly 50, 60 students on this campus that came out of the foster care system, inviting them to get together so we could learn from them and they could build their own community through shared experience and such, it, it doesn't exist. It simply doesn't happen at any of the system schools. What about building staff and infrastructure for the folks that are already doing great work and stretched thin I'm talking about strategic investments to build capacity who are intentionally reaching out to the 800, 900 that are aging out every year to say, we know who you are. We have started working with you at age 15, 16 to make sure you have your pathway identified to have some higher learning after high school. That function, again, as I stand here, doesn't exist. And there are many more cool ideas. I just want to wrap up with this one. What if we just stopped treating the kids like they did something wrong? We've all had bad days in our childhood. But imagine if your bad day turned into a really bad decade. Like that rain cloud that broke open just became a heavier rain for the next 10, 12, 20 years of your life. So I'm Jeff Snell. I'm a social innovator. I'm asking you to consider being the same. The next link that you see is a landing page where you can provide your contact information. And I promise you I'll never use it for anything other than to communicate with you. You'll never be solicited for money. But if you'd like to find out how this campus community and others can problem solve together and use social innovation to get after this persistent, solvable problem, I'd love to hear from you. I'm the proud son of Art and Joyce Snell, proud badger, and I'm the extended family member to 327 foster care kids. Thank you.